Okay, so once again, I'll, I'll uh, kick off. So I'm Bill Farner. Uh, I have here David Chung as well. We're going to do an introduction to Infricate. We have a demo lined up, and we're going to have some time for Q&A at the end. So uh, first, I want to describe how we got started building Infricate. And what it really began with was uh, a goal to make it easier to install Docker on various environments um, and provide sort of a common platform for Docker in, in different environments like uh, different cloud providers. So this is kind of the summary of our mission was uh, to, to make Docker cluster infrastructure as simple and portable as Docker applications. I, I assume if you're on this call, I don't have to convince you that Docker applications are both simple and portable. That's kind of the, the goal of, of the Docker company and product. Um, but setting up the infrastructure for a Docker cluster is uh, is still hard. And that's not a, not really an indictment of Docker itself, but more just the uh, the discontinuity of all the different cloud providers and all the different in institutional knowledge that you gain as you use different cloud providers. So uh, th this is one alternate reality we could have ended up down, um, but we tried to avoid, which is setting up uh, different different silos for. Is this good? Uh, yeah, some people that can't hear us. Yeah. Um, so we really wanted to avoid having sort of separate stacks for each of these different environments and, and uh, creating a fixed setup cost. So really we wanted to build some common tools and common uh, systems so that we could share some components and provide a, a consistent user experience for these different Docker editions that we were going to work on. So this kind of illustrates a little bit more closely the, the idea that we had for, for designing the, uh, the Docker editions and, and the systems behind the scenes where we have sort of some, some common pieces and a common user experience, but then we sort of, uh, sort of fill in the blanks for different cloud providers as needed. So we'd end up with a plugin or some sort of an adapter for AWS and ACS uh, and so on for other providers as we decide to, to roll out first class experiences there. Uh, and as we were building this, we realized very quickly that uh, you know, we had some prototypes and basically the word Docker hardly made an appearance. And uh, this made us realize that the, the tooling and systems that we had produced were not Docker specific at all, and we could probably generalize this and uh, basically have a better design system as a result, but also uh, offer it to more, more broad use cases as well. So we went back and revised the mission statement, and it was pretty easy. We just removed the, the first Docker from the, the mission uh, to you know, change it to make cluster infrastructure as simple and portable as Docker applications. So that's kind of what we're shooting for now is to, to make it possible to, to build and manage the low-level infrastructure for a cluster, any cluster, uh, as simple as it is to, to build Docker applications and make them as portable as well. So as a, a very broad summary, uh, just to kind of lead into the rest of, of the presentation, uh, but sort of the, the TLDR, if you walk away with nothing else, this is kind of a... a, a, a indication of what we're trying to build with InfraKit. Um, and really, it's a, it's a toolkit for infrastructure orchestration. So I highlight infrastructure orchestration there because we're not really aiming for container orchestration or any other type of high-level orchestration. We're really focused on orchestrating the infrastructure itself. Uh, another very simple way to think about InfraKit is that it's sort of like scaling groups for any environment. So if you've used uh, a few of the cloud providers before, there's a pretty common pattern of, of scaling groups in, in AWS and Azure and GCE, um, but you know, in so, several other environments, those don't exist. And uh, this is just one simple moniker for for InfraKit is that it's it's kind of like that, but you can take it really anywhere and use it anywhere. And lastly, at least at this point in time, InfraKit is very young, so it's going to look raw. There's going to be a lot of rough edges. Um, we're basically trying to build it as much as we can in the open. So that's why we open source it very early so we can get lots of, of feedback and uh, hopefully open to more broad use cases uh, as we design. Now, as I, I briefly alluded to earlier, um, we, we sort of pivoted the design of InfraKit before it was even labeled InfraKit uh, because it was generic and not really associated with Docker. So um, to kind of think about from, from the reverse of what InfraKit is, we're, we'll talk about what InfraKit is not. And uh, first and foremost, it is not coupled to Docker. And uh, it, is, it is actually an explicit goal to not couple it to Docker. Uh, 
because we want it to be more more broadly applicable than uh, than any Docker specific products. Uh, we're also tr not trying to build a configuration management system with InfraKit. Um, as you first look at it and how you use InfraKit, it can definitely appear like uh, like we're trying to be a competitor to the various configuration management tools, but we really see those as building a different uh, different set of use cases and solving different problems than what we're trying to do with with InfraKit. And we can go into some detail on how it's differentiated, but uh, but just know that our, our goal is not to replace those systems. And in fact, uh, we think there's some interesting opportunities to work um, uh, to work with things like Terraform as a complement to InfraKit. And finally, and possibly most importantly, we're not thinking of InfraKit as an alternative to uh, products like Swarm or Kubernetes. Um, again, sort of like with Terraform, but at a different level, InfraKit can very much be a complement to Swarm and Kubernetes. And part of the demo today will actually be showing how it, it works as a complement to Swarm. And that design works uh, very well in, in a Kubernetes or, or other orchestration system model as well. Um, but very briefly there, the, uh, to picture how it fits in with Something like Swarm or Kubernetes, uh, all you have to do is ask how you set up your Swarm or Kubernetes cluster. And usually the answer is a variety of different tools or home-based scripts. And uh, really that's what we're, we're trying to solve with InfraKit is provide that base platform for, uh, for deploying and managing the, the cluster orchestrators themselves. Uh, so some key features of, of InfraKit that uh, that differentiate it from sort of the status quo of managing clusters. Uh, and one of the most important things to us is InfraKit relies very heavily on declarative state. Uh, we really want to avoid building a system that is imperative in nature. So we're, we're trying to focus on user inputs that are purely declarative. So you'll be seeing uh, interactions with InfraKit that look more like uh, defining what the state of the cluster should be rather than defining small modifications to uh, have the user converge the cluster to a desired state. Uh, but instead, we want the system to manage that. So uh, so basically, you'll be telling InfraKit, this is what my cluster should look like, and its, it's duty is to figure out how it actually accomplishes that. Uh, and, and in addition to that, it's doing that work continuously. So it's constantly looking at the state of, of the infrastructure and matching that against the, the declared state that it's previously received and, uh, and trying to make adjustments to, to ensure that the, the state of the cluster mirrors uh, the, the user's desire. Uh, and so it, it does this in a couple of different ways, but uh, primarily it's about managing the configuration and managing the different instances, uh, either through instance count or through you're managing uh, sort of pet-like instances, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit more soon. Uh, and finally, and possibly less so, uh, we're trying to bias the system towards immutable infrastructure. So you'll notice in some parts of the system there are there are verbs like create and delete, but there are no uh, there is no update. Uh, and that's at this point by design, we really want to encourage uh, embracing uh, immutable infrastructure so that uh, overall management of systems and infrastructure is simpler and uh, you know, there are basically fewer edge cases to think about when managing machines. So I mentioned in the beginning that InfraKit is a, a toolkit. So this is how we're thinking about it as a toolkit and why we're, why we're calling it a toolkit. Um, and first and foremost, it's because it provides, a primitives, uh, provides primitives for managing groups of resources. So, um, so I mentioned sort of the create and delete. So there's various things like that that we think are, are low-level primitives for managing different types of resources. Uh, in addition to that, InfraKit works with a collection of components that operate as plugins. Uh, and, and you'll see this throughout InfraKit. There are, there are plugins that are heavily used. Uh, and InfraKit itself doesn't have a whole lot of behavior definition. As, in fact, almost all of it is through plugins. Uh, InfraKit really just more defines the, the configuration syntax and the use of configuration. And finally, as part of the toolkit, we offer a series of abstractions, patterns, and, and APIs. Um, mostly the APIs relate to the plugins directly, uh, but this kind of summarizes the different attributes of the system that we think make it uh, a fit for the, the term toolkit, um, because it's really uh, a, a series of components that you can use to accomplish something, but really not something that we necessarily intend to be used directly that often. 
so to go a little bit deeper into plugins, there currently are three primary types of plugins in, in for Kit. Uh, the first one that people will probably be thinking about the most is instance plugins. So this is basically how resources are actually provisioned. Uh, so an instance is a, a single unit of resource. For example, an EC2 instance in the case of AWS. Um, and basically an instance plugin is, is responsible for figuring out how to create, delete, and list re resources that, uh, that qualify as instances. Groups are, are basically a collection of instances. So there's some operations that you can perform on group plugins that relate to managing them as a collection and not individually. And this is the part that uh, that kind of resembles a scaling group. Um, so, in, in fact, you could very well implement a group plugin that uses auto scaling groups as an example. So, it is a, a pretty close analog. And finally, flavors define basically just some modification to an instance. So, uh, for example, you might install some software on the machine or configure some application. Um, or in, in the case of the example here, uh, you might invoke Swarm join to uh, to associate an instance with uh, with a Swarm cluster. So just to illustrate that a little bit differently, these are kind of how the the different plugin types relate and the different uh, the different operations that you can perform with each of them. Or, or or from the reverse, if you're implementing one of these types of plugins, the types of operations you need to provide. So the, the top one is the, the group plugin, and that's actually the only plugin type that Infricate itself sort of natively understands. Uh, and then the other two are basically artifacts of the default group plugin that we provide. So basically, we've we've provided a scaling group implementation, and to generalize that, we have two different plugin types that the uh, the default implementation uses to uh, to basically be more abstract and handle different types of provisioning and different types of software. Um, but basically with a group, you have roughly CRUD operations, um, but you'll notice that we've called the create watch uh, and the destroy, uh, well, it's basically destroy and unwatch. And watch and unwatch are basically how you can sort of attach and detach the scaling group itself. Uh, groups do have an update, so that's a rolling update. Um, and uh, you'll, you'll see that in action shortly, hopefully. Flavors are responsible for preparing uh, software. So that's where they have an opportunity to modify the, the behavior of an instance or basically the, the setup shell code that, uh, that is run on an instance. And to service updates, we have health, uh, health checks and drain. Um, so this is how we can perform updates in a safe way with a feedback loop where the flavors, so for example, the swarm flavor can report back whether uh, whether it thinks that a given instance is healthy and it has performed its duty as running uh, running the Docker software in swarm mode. Uh, and finally, instance plugins. This is basically the the low level nuts and bolts of just managing instances. So if you look at one of these, especially on a cloud provider, it's more or less a one to one mapping with uh, with some third party API, and really really we're just providing plumbing to that. So one of the hardest parts with designing this type of system is figuring out the right level of abstraction. Uh, and I want to go into detail on this because it kind of sets the stage for why the configuration looks the way it does. Uh, but basically, the, the approach that we took is we wanted to start with very high-level nouns and verbs, just sort of a very broad level what you would want to do with these different types of resources, and, uh, and basically going from there to figure out uh, what types of uh, entities we need to define. Uh, but the most important part is we really wanted to focus on avoiding rigid schemas that uh, that create basically generalizations or lowest common denominators for different uh, different types of uh, components that you can use. So to rephrase that, basically we don't want uh, we don't want people to have to perform sort of mental gymnastics to map between our configuration language or DSL into the, the parameters and types that you interact with with different cloud providers. So for example, in, uh, in the, the case of EC2, uh, if you want to reference an AMI, you're going to use the term AMI. You're not going to use some sort of generalization that we define for an image or a uh, base, uh, base layer or anything like that for the system. You, you'll always be using the, the native types, so to speak. 
So the way that this has, uh, has manifested itself is with extremely abstract schemas. So essentially parts of the system that shouldn't know about the, the different types of different layers are just really not exposed to them because the schemas are abstracted away. So for example, the group plugin should really know nothing about something like AMIs because it's really not responsible for, for dealing with that. But instead the instance plugin would have to know that and as a result uh, has sort of a more concrete definition of the schema that it's configured with. And uh, if, if you've programmed in Go much, you've probably seen the, the raw message type in the JSON package. And uh, basically that's, that's how we take this approach is uh, by using JSON raw messages all over the place. Uh, and if you grep our repository, you can see there's quite a few references. Uh, when I did this, it was, there were 132 references. Uh, however, that abstraction stops pretty much immediately once you enter the actual problem domain. So this uh, is a snippet of code from our AWS instance plugin. And at the top, I basically have the type that we unmarshal from JSON, uh, so from that abstract schema, into the type that the, the plugin actually cares about. And what I want to highlight here, this kind of relates to the uh, basically using the raw native types of the of the appropriate infrastructure. We actually literally accept the the RPC that's used to create an instance with EC2. So this is we we think this is very powerful because you you basically have unfettered access to any field that is part of that and uh, it doesn't really require any glue code on our side to, to define that and uh, it doesn't require any any mapping between the the type that you're actually trying to define or the field you're trying to, to specify and whatever plumbing that we've used to expose it. And this is a, a pattern that we're trying to maintain in the, the sort of plug-in ecosystem as we grow uh, and we think it's a very very important thing to basically not get in the way of the user who's trying to specify the, the configuration for their, their resources. So to step back a little bit and uh, explain how this is actually set up, uh, this is a, sort of a skeleton of a group configuration with InfraKit. Uh, and the top two fields are like, basically that's all that InfraKit knows about. It knows the ID for a group and that there are some properties, uh, but beyond that, Infricate itself knows nothing more. Uh, in the case that you're using the default group plugin, uh, you're going to see these other three fields. I'll skip allocation for now, but uh, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, but so I mentioned the instance plugin. So the default group plugin requires an instance field, which defines basically how the instances as a part of that group are created and managed. And basically, that pattern then is sort of recursive on itself that we once again have another uh, a plugin name and they're basically abstract to the group plugin uh, because it really doesn't need to know what what those details are and w once again with the flavor it's basically the same thing there's some flavor plugin that is responsible for those duties of setting up instances and there's some abstract configuration associated with that to get a little bit more concrete here's a, a group configuration that uh, could potentially set up an Nginx group. So this would be a, a, a sort of a scaling group of size three that uh, runs in Vagrant and also runs Nginx. Uh, now, uh, I just want to call out, don't try this configuration directly. It's mostly for illustration purposes, uh, but uh, basically a very similar configuration could work just fine. Uh, but so sort of highlighting the, the same details that were in the previous slide, uh, we have an identifier for the group, and that's basically how you interact with the group via InfraKit. Uh, it's basically just a name that you give it for a unique handle. Uh, we have configuration for the instance plugin. So in this case, I'm configuring the Vagrant instance plugin, and uh, basically below that, we have some properties that are really only known to that plugin. Uh, so it's basically a direct conversation between the configuration and the plugin itself, and for the rest of the purpose of the system, uh, it's basically opaque. Uh, but the, the Vagrant instance plugin has uh, at least one parameter called box, which is the base image for the machine. And uh, going down to the flavor plugin, we're, we're setting up the vanilla flavor plugin, which basically doesn't really provide much in the way of, uh, of ease of use. It's kind of just a way to, 
specify a raw shell code to run as a part of the instance setup. And here we're configuring that with running a, a Docker image that has Nginx in it. Now, if you were to use the InfraKit uh, command line interface, this is basically what you see. So uh, the, the focus is really on the group level commands and operations that you can perform. I mentioned that you can do rolling upgrades or uh, rolling updates with, with InfraKit. So there's a few commands associated with that. Um, and again, I'll show you this in action, but these are just the, the broad uh, basic operations that you can perform with, with InfraKit. And I'll show you those in a moment. Uh, so now let's uh, let's move towards starting this this demo. So since there's a lot of moving parts, what I want to do is summarize what's going to happen so that uh, some of the, of the the result makes some sense. But essentially, we're going to create a, a Docker cluster using uh, using AWS, and we've basically split it up into two groups in the InfraKit sense. Uh, so we're, we're, gonna, we're going to manage workers and manager nodes separately, um, and that's partially because of the EBS volumes that you see attached. So basically, we can treat worker nodes more or less as stateless. They don't really have uh, any required state that they need to store locally. And on the manager side, however, uh, they do have state that they store in, in Raft, and we want to make that durable, so we're going to be using InfraKit's capabilities to auto-attach volumes uh, to accomplish that. And let's see what else we've, so the cluster is going to have three workers, three managers. Uh, we're going to be setting up a VPC and security groups for each of the work uh, of the node types. And uh, finally, one detail I want to call out is you'll note that we intend to set up Docker on both the managers and workers because that's required for setting up a swarm. Uh, but we're running InfraKit only on the manager nodes. And the reason for that is InfraKit doesn't really have any business running on, on the worker nodes. There's really nothing for it to do because its interest is in orchestrating the clusters. And uh, because it's all declarative and immutable state for the, for the cluster configuration, there's really no, no work to be done on the, the worker nodes. So the plugins that, I, that I'm going to use to accomplish this, there's the default group plugin. Uh, there's the AWS instance plugin, because I do want to run an AWS. And then I'm going to use basically two different flavors. And there's a, a third flavor that I use to, to uh, compose those together. But I'm going to use the vanilla plugin to inject some shell code and the swarm plugin to configure and run the nodes as swarm, uh, as swarm nodes in a cluster. Um, so because that's still not entirely clear, what I'm going to do is kind of show how the actual uh, interaction between these plugins works. So, so first of all, uh, I'm going to be running some shell code that will instruct the group plugin to start watching this group. Uh, so in this case, I'm, I'll focus on, on worker nodes, uh, but it's almost identical for manager nodes. Uh, after after being asked to watch the group, the group plugin is going to turn around and ask the instance plugin to list all the instances that are a part of that group so that it can decide whether it needs to take any action. In the case when the cluster is starting up, uh, the group plugin will notice that there are several instances that are missing because we're basically going to start with just one, uh, and it's going to want to reconcile that by adding more instances. So it's going to ask the flavor combo plugin to prepare the prepare the instance that, it, uh, that it's intending to create. That plugin will in turn ask the vanilla plugin to prepare the instance uh, and basically recurse. Uh, similarly, it'll ask the flavor uh, swarm plugin to prepare the instance. Uh, and this one does a little bit more work because it basically has to ask Docker engine for the, the join token. So if you've set up a swarm before, uh, you've probably noticed this, that you use these uh, secure join tokens to manage nodes that are that are entering the cluster. So, so the way we accomplish that, and this is partially another advantage of co-locating InfraKit with Docker on the manager nodes, that we have direct access to the manager nodes that, that have the, the join tokens. So basically what we're going to do is we'll gather that token from the local Docker engine via the, uh, via the Docker socket, and we actually inject that into 
boot time shellcode for setting up the instance. And that's basically how we distribute those tokens in a, in a semi-secure way. And finally, once the, the instance has been fully prepared, the group plugin is going to pass that on to the instance plugin uh, to actually perform a create operation. So if you've been thinking critically about this, you're probably wondering, okay, so Inforkit is responsible for creating resources. Uh, you know, it's basically a provisioning engine. Um, but basically, how do you start? Because something has to create the Inforkit. Uh, so it's not entirely obvious how you get to the point that you have this cluster that I showed earlier. Uh, so once we're there, it's pretty clear how it works, but, uh, but basically how do we get there? So I'll, I'll dial back a little bit. Um, this is basically the, the state of the cluster that we're after. And what we're thinking about this as right now is essentially a bootstrap routine that needs to be performed before InfraKit begins running. So, so the graphic on the right illustrates basically the the target setup for the bootstrap operation, where uh, we basically are required to set up all of the resources that Infricate itself does not already actively manage. So that's gonna be the BDC, the security groups, subnets, uh, really all the networking entities. It's gonna create the EBS volumes uh, and basically that initial instance that has Infricate itself that uh, has run Swarm init and also has all the, the components necessary to run the Infricit configuration that we're after. So that's going to be the actual JSON config files, the uh, setting up the plugins that are necessary for the, uh, the setup to run, and finally invoking group watch on each of those so that we can start active management. Uh, and one other detail that I, I kind of glazed over, it's also going to be responsible for setting up the IAM role. Uh, so if you've not used AWS before, uh, IAM roles are basically a way that you can uh, perform passwordless or, uh, or secretless operations with the AWS API. So that's basically how Infrakit will be creating resources without us have to, having to do credential management. Um, so just by virtue of being associated with instances that have that authority to create other instances uh, we can we can perform those operations in, in an authorized way, but but also not uh, not have to deal with credentials or secrets. All right, so now for the actual demo. So there's a bit of code that I'm going to run here, which basically is the, the bootstrap operation that I mentioned, and uh, I'll, I'll kick that off and give a little bit more detail about what's happening. Um, but basically, it's going to perform a series of uh, operations with the AWS API. Oh, I, I ran the destroy. Okay. So, yeah, we'll start with create. And there's three parameters I'm going to be using. There's the, the name of the SSH key that I, I'll be using. Uh, I have a name for the cluster just so that I can run multiple without them interfering with each other. And, of course, the AWS region that I'll be running in. So basically, this step of the of the system you can think of as not dissimilar from CloudFormation. There's basically a sequence of resources that we need to set up. Uh, I, yeah, so we have this issue with uh, with I am occasionally. If you've if you've ever been coding in Terraform, you may have had this fun before. Um, but there's basically some incon inconsistencies in the AWS API that we have to kind of fiddle with. So one moment as I create, uh, destroy and create again. So yeah, as I was saying, this step you can think of kind of like uh, running the initial cloud formation setup for the cluster. Uh, it's going to walk through all of the resources that we need in order to create. Okay. So David actually was worried about this. And I am just going to... Let's see. 
So sorry for the delay. There's basically this one resource that AWS unfortunately doesn't really give us access to know when it's actually ready. And turns out early in the morning, a lot of people are hammering on that API. Yeah, sure. Uh, so there, there's going to be a, a few delays here, so it's a good time to take any questions that you have. Uh, okay. So the question is, uh, with the types of inconsistent issues like the IAM example, is there is an actual destroyer required to converge the state then? Uh, so at this point, yes, and this is basically just uh, an example of just sort of the demo state of the bootstrapping. Uh, for Infricate itself, there is no, uh, you know, basically it can encounter errors and move on just fine. Um, but, but basically the bootstrap operation uh, doesn't have a whole lot of robustness built in yet. Okay, so, so now we've basically gotten to the point where uh, going back to this bootstrap illustration, uh, so all of these resources have been created and that first manager node is now starting up. Um, so this, you know, basically we're booting up a VM, so there's probably going to be 30 seconds to a minute, uh, if we're lucky, for that to be created and then start setting up the rest of the cluster. Um, so if there's another question, I can, I can take one more probably while this is making progress. Uh, so the question is, when you say health, what, is, what does that really mean? Not restarting, what is your definition of health? Uh, good question. So basically, the, uh, it's sort of up to the flavor plugin to define that. Um, and I'll, I'll show actually what the, the health check looks like for the, the Swarm flavor plugin. Uh, but, but basically, it's, uh, the, the contract is that it's some indication to the uh, sort of the scalar implementation that this instance cannot be considered uh, fit to continue running and basically that it should be destroyed. Uh, so in the case of, um, of Swarm, basically what we do is we watch the local Docker API because we are on a, a man manager node and we check to see if that node has successfully joined the Swarm. So that's kind of the current implementation of what we think deems a, a node that is running Swarm in a healthy way, that it was able to be created, it was able to run Swarm far enough to get to the point that the, the node successfully joined the Swarm. Uh, and we're not utilizing the, the health check in a, in a sort of federated sense yet. Um, basically, right now, it's just a feedback uh, signal for, um, for updates. So in the course of an update, we'll basically stall the update until we have positive confirmation that the node has uh, has been set up correctly. So this is my manager node that I've just updated into. This is sort of the one that we're calling the seed node. Uh, okay, so we got a little bit further ahead than I was expecting. We're actually fully set up at this point. Um, so uh, if I'd gotten in a little bit earlier, you would have seen just this one node that was in. Um, but at this point, uh, that first node started up, uh, ran the Infricate configurations, and then set up all of the five remaining nodes, uh, two of which are our manager nodes and the remainder are workers. Uh, to show you a little bit of how that actually worked. Uh, so this is going to be the, the configuration for the worker group in the uh, in the Infricit configuration. So some of this should look familiar to the earlier configuration that I showed. Um, and so, so we have a group of size three. We're setting up the AWS instance plugin, um, and then there's a large series of, of fields that are basically null. And that's basically just because we're using, again, that raw uh, API type from the AWS Go SDK. Uh, 
but essentially all of these could be omitted, but because of, because it was auto-generated, they're all explicitly there and null. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of setup for the actual AWS instance, but to, to sort of emphasize the use of native types, you know, you basically see all of the details right here in, in the uh, the raw AWS parlance. So uh, if you've used the AWS SDK before, a lot of these should look very familiar because uh, these are just the types that are directly from that SDK. Uh, as for the, the details that are more relevant to Infricate itself, for setting up the flavor for running a Swarm node, uh, in this case a worker node, uh, we're configuring the, the Swarm flavor plugin. And the only details for a worker that we care about uh, is we tell the, the flavor plugin that this node is of type worker. Uh, that basically tells it which join token to use when setting up the node. Because that's really all that in, uh, in Docker's form, that's all that really is, is different between the worker and managers. Uh, and then there's also a command that we need to specify to restart Docker. So basically when the flavor plugin reconfigures Docker, uh, we need some way to sort of affect that change. And because Infrigate doesn't know the, the OS on the target machine, uh, it's really basically a detail internal to this AMI that we've, we've used. Uh, we, we have to specify that because it's, a, it's an OS specific thing that defines how to restart Docker. Uh, now for the managers, that setup is a little bit more complicated. Uh, we use a sequence of logical IDs, uh, and this is because with Docker Swarm managers, uh, we basically want fixed IP addresses for the, the manager nodes. This, um, this basically makes it much safer to remove and add instances, so basically separating compute from the state that's associated with the nodes, uh, because this is how Quorum's use of Raft identifies members of Raft Quorum. Uh, and this is basically what Infricate is going to manage. So uh, instead of managing a fixed size of instances, it cares more about the actual identifiers that are used for them. Um, so for example, if, if Infricate notices that there's a node that's a member with an identifier of 192.168.33.7, uh, it's going to remove that because the specification was four, five, and six. Uh, and likewise, if one of those is missing, it'll create that. Uh, the instance configuration is, all, I think, identical to the, the workers, uh, except perhaps using the, a different security group. Uh, but the flavor plugin configuration is quite different uh, for a few reasons. However, you do still see, uh, like I mentioned, we're composing the Swarm flavor plugin with the vanilla flavor, so the Swarm flavor configuration looks uh, almost identical with the exception that we're specifying the manager type. And and the uh, vanilla flavor is configured basically with some shell code. So uh, again, the vanilla flavor basically just allows you to have raw data that you, you uh, inject into the, the boot commands for the machine. And here, if I were to expand this out, it's, uh, it's basically just attaching the EBS volume that's associated uh, and also formatting it if, if necessary. Um, but that's, this is basically how we get durability of the, the swarm state by, by managing that EBS volume. And on the, the target host, we have to uh, basically make sure that we mount that volume that, that has been attached. So that's, that's it for my demo. It's, uh, it's a great time to move into any, any more questions. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure I went through things pretty quickly, but uh, yeah, please feel free to ask questions that you have. Let's see. So, all right, so this is kind of a two-parter. Uh, you mentioned that Infricate is not config management like Terraform or Puppet, and it's not container management. Uh, so who or what are competitive products doing for kit? Uh, that's a really good question, and that's, that's something that um, I think we've been trying to define what we're not competitive to, as you, as you point out, but haven't really pointed out what we are. Uh, I think that the best example of a competitor right now would be basically uh, AWS CloudFormation. Uh, and, you know, basically what we're looking for is, is 
some piece of that, basically an interesting piece of that, that we can take to different environments. Um, I think CloudFormation is a really great tool because it, it does try to emphasize some of the same goals of what we're doing with Infricit, um, but we, we just want to basically bring that to environments other than AWS. So another question, what is the difference between Swarm and Infricit and Terraform and Infricit? So, the difference between Swarm and Infricate is basically the um, kind of the, the part of the, of the stack that we want to fit into. Swarm is very interested in service management, application management, um, dealing with networking between different applications, basically how you stitch together uh, your, the applications that you're actually looking to deploy on your infrastructure, whereas Infricate is more interested in providing a, a platform-neutral way to set up the infrastructure that provides those those uh, features. So it can be used in a lot of different ways, but the, the primary interest right now is basically a common set of tools and, and uh, systems for managing something like a swarm. Uh, so, so again, I think I mentioned this briefly earlier that uh, if, if I ask you how you set up your swarm, you'll, you'll, if I ask 10 different people, they'll probably give me 10 different answers. And what we really want to do is provide an answer that uh, that works across several different providers at the very least. Oh, actually, and I didn't I didn't mention the difference between Terraform and Infricate. So Terraform is is more focused uh, for uh, for two two reasons. Uh, it's more focused with individual machines, whereas Infricate is focused on groups of resources. So um, you know basically focusing on primitives that deal with clusters instead of individual machines. Um, and also, Infricate is focused on, on active management. So Terraform, uh, you could retrofit it to use it in an active, uh, sort of actively reconciling system, um, but basically that's what we're trying to accomplish first class with Infricate. Uh, another question, how is this different from creating AWS instances using Amazon EC2 Docker machine driver? Uh, so you could do a part of what I just showed with Docker machine. Um, but similar to the, the comparison to Terraform, uh, Docker machine is mostly interested in making it very easy to set up Docker, uh, basically a singular Docker node in different environments whereas we're interested in laying out an entire cluster and also furthermore uh, providing ways to set up clusters uh, of nodes that interact with each other. So uh, while you could script what I just, I think you could script what I just showed using Docker machine, uh, but it would require more work to configure them to interact in a, in a swarm cluster and uh, there would also be no active management. So if instances were to be taken out of rotation, for example, uh, there would be nothing that would automatically reconcile that. All right, the question, why would you put the stateless app on the workers versus agents? Can you expand on the comment of AJ? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. So I'll hop back to slides for that. So the, the comment about HA was basically referencing the fact that we're running Infricate itself on uh, on multiple nodes. So basically, we're we're accomplishing high availability of the Docker Swarm cluster itself in that we can tolerate failure of one manager node, uh, and we also have high availability of Infricate itself. Uh, now it is worth pointing out that the the actual code that I ran does not have high availability of Infricate, so if we lose that initial Infricate instance for whatever reason, uh, there currently is no failover. However, that's something that I was hoping that we would have ready for today, uh, but are not quite there, but it should land in the next uh, week or so for sure. So the question, uh, so we're seeing a demo for AWS. What about other providers like uh, Azure, SoftLayer, GCP, and other small players? Uh, so yeah, basically we're super early days so like right now we have some targets for very specific providers, but uh, basically our goal is to make it extremely easy to build 
support for other providers and also contribute uh, and, and own your own support for other providers. So, uh, so you can consider this sort of the hopeful start of an ecosystem that uh, other providers could provide their own implementations or as we look to provide first class support for, for Docker, we, we go and, and build our own first class implementations. Uh, question, instead of using a flavor for using a flavor that sets up Kubernetes, and that's absolutely correct. So that, and that's basically why we've created the, the abstractions that we did, is that we don't want to couple the system to, to Docker or to Docker Swarm. Um, and uh, we actually have somebody working on, on Kubernetes set up right now. Uh, it is a little more complicated than setting up Swarm, but I'm hoping that we can demonstrate that in the coming weeks. Uh, question, is the project at a point where a self-healing cluster works? Are you feeling brave and do you want to demo it now? Uh, if not, that would be a great focus for a future demo. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's, it depends what exactly you mean by, uh, by works. But uh, basically, like, we're hoping to, to provide this uh, basically to people at large using Docker editions in, in the short term. So uh, I think with the addition of the high availability support that we kind of talked about but isn't actually in yet, uh, once we have that, I think we'll be very comfortable to, uh, to run that in a, in a production environment. Uh, question, are you planning to make this Infricate a tool to manage elastic demand? Uh, so basically using some of the more advanced features of, uh, of AWS auto scaling groups to respond to actual load on the system. And I, I think we can definitely accomplish that. Uh, we, we haven't really thought about what the interactions and the APIs would look like to do that, but uh, suffice it to say, we think that managing the provisioning and uh, basically uh, number of worker nodes in a swarm cluster is a very interesting problem, and I think we'd, we'd love to have that be a dynamic feature. Uh, I think it will Will require some interaction with Swarm itself to provide it in a, a sort of reliable and non-disruptive way, but it's something that we definitely would, would be interested in doing. Uh, question, will Infricate eventually be uh, also be able to manage things like VPC and security groups or equivalents? That's something that we're, we're actively talking about right now. Um, the focus, as, as you can see, is mostly on managing instances, so the, the scaling group analog. Uh, I think it's going to be inevitable that we need to provide a story for managing resources like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's something that we're, we're actively discussing with other teams right now because basically we have that need for Docker as well. So, uh, so I think the, the, the brief answer is yes, we, we think we need to manage things like that. Um, I think I've answered the, the differentiation from Ansible, Salt, Chef, and Puppet, but uh, please follow up if you don't think so. Ah, so can it also work on a hybrid environment? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by hybrid environment. Uh, I guess just to put my own thoughts into it, if you mean like a hybrid cloud and private, uh, like sort of on-premise environment, uh, then I think the answer is yes. Um, basically, you know, part of the part of the side effect of the way that we've designed it, I think it works actually pretty naturally in a in an on-premise environment, and we've actually had some interest in building support for things like IPMI networks and Pixie booting. Uh, so basically, turning an on-premise environment into something more dynamic and cloud-like, and I think with that feature enabled, it's it's very reasonable to to use this in a uh, sort of a hybrid cloud environment. Uh, question, you mentioned active management. Can you outline the active management features? So that, that is basically the, the piece that um, reconciles failure of instances. So, so for example, and actually I can show you this, I probably should have already shown you this. Uh, I'm going to hop over to the the AWS uh, interface. 
just going to stop sharing briefly while I quickly log in. So what I'm going to what I'm going to show is uh, some of the active management in action, um, and I will terminate an, an AWS node or an AWS instance and. Uh, and show that it basically reconciles that uh, notices that the, that an instance is missing and goes goes ahead and creates an alternate. So bear with me for one moment. Okay, so I'm in the, the AWS UI, and what I'm going to do is pick one of the worker nodes. Uh, so this is one. I'm just going to go ahead and terminate it. And in the course of doing that, let's see. so we should already see, or very shortly see, one of the nodes up here as down. So I'm just going to basically pull the output of a Docker node LS, and we should. Oh, we, so there you go. You see, one went down, and pretty pretty quickly, uh, a node appear. Well, actually, it won't be terribly quick because they have to wait for the VM to boot up. Um, so we can basically continue that in the background while it fields another question. So question, is the Infricate API mature enough to do what you just demoed? Could you, uh, could you plug this into an existing automation pipeline? I, I think that is, is possible. Uh, it depends on the, the automation pipeline, but uh, I think it could fit pretty well into something like a deploy pipeline. Uh, although, I, I don't know if I would recommend a, a totally hands-off automation now because it is young and I would feel more comfortable if operators were sort of babysitting a little bit as, as we flush out any potential rough edges. Okay, so uh, just on, uh, as I was finishing that question, you saw one of these nodes just showed up. Uh, I realized I, I skipped over part of my demo. Uh, so another thing that I'd like to show, again, while fielding some questions, I'm going to show a rolling update. Uh, so. So just for a simple example, let's say that I wanted to increase the size of the worker nodes to small um, because I basically want more resources for them. So what I can do from there so the first thing that I generally recommend with updates is that you ask the system what it thinks it's going to do. Um, and actually, I'll make one more change as well. So I'm going to increase the size of the, the worker group, so make it a slightly more complicated update. So, so it informs us that to perform this update, it's going to roll three instances and then add one because I wanted a group size of four. So I can go ahead and run this update. And Unfortunately, we don't like begin because it is young. We don't have any feedback for that right now, so we can just basically watch the node ls output again. Uh, actually, I'll show one other thing. Let's do. So this is basically the the log the, the console output for the group plugin, um, so you can kind of see what it's doing as it's proceeding. Uh, so right here, so we see this is when it was determining that we. Oh, I guess this is not the update. So so earlier up here. Oh no, that's something different. 
Um, sorry, I'm just trying to track. Basically, I was, I was going to identify the point where we actually reconciled that one missing instance. But at any rate, uh, this, like, basically, it's performing the update right now. And in the course of doing that, it first destroyed one of the instances that was of the old configuration, uh, then proceeded to create another one that matched the new configuration. Uh, and, and then there's some delay there, so we're basically waiting for, for things to catch up. So we are running short on time, but I'll skip back to the questions while this happens because we are going to wait for several VMs to boot up. Um, so question, are there examples of InfraKit in Azure? Uh, we don't have that yet, but stay tuned. We should have an Azure example out, I hope, in the next month or so. Uh, question, what are the next cool features coming up for InfraKit? Is there a roadmap available online? Uh, there's not a roadmap, but we definitely need to, to create that. Uh, so one feature I alluded to is uh, HA support so that we can basically have InfraKit or the manager itself, uh, or the, or the provisioning manager itself, uh, operate in a highly available way so that we can tolerate node loss. Um, and I think beyond that, I also mentioned that management of other resource types is something we're very keenly interested in, and sort of first-class support for bootstrapping is something that I think we're going to need in the near term so that it's obvious how you can actually get up and going with InfraKit without needing other tools to get you there. So skipping back to the update really quick. So if you recall, I created small instances, and at this point, we've successfully set one up. I think we're waiting for the other one to finish joining, uh, but we're almost done with that update. Uh, another question, you mentioned that InfraKit is similar to AWS CloudFormation. On AWS-specific cloud platform, what would be the advantage of using InfraKit versus just CloudFormation? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think at this point, if you are only using AWS, uh, it's there's not a lot of compelling change just yet, uh, but I guess the biggest benefit would be just decoupling from the AWS ecosystem, uh, so that if you do move out of AWS or want to operate in multiple providers simultaneously, you have consistent tooling and some consistent systems to build up your your base uh, software stack. Uh, question, does InfraKit actually use slash create CloudFormation on the back end? Uh, we, we did have an initial prototype where we did that, but at this point, it, it does not. It's all direct interaction with the AWS API, uh, although I guess that could be CloudFormation, but we're, we're interacting with the, the EC2 instance uh, API, basically. Uh, and you can see that code in the, uh, the InfraKit, one of the InfraKit repos. Uh, so going back to my, my slides briefly, so I, we have uh, our GitHub repo here, and if you add infrakit.aws at the end, uh, that's basically where our, uh, our AWS code lives. Question, it looks like it's doing a sequential roll for the update as you described. Very large clusters, that would be inefficient. Can you control how many instances are rolled in parallel? Not currently, but it would be pretty trivial for us to add that, and that's definitely something that, that I would like to add. So I agree that it would be far too slow for large clusters. Uh, and quickly back to the, 
the uh, update itself. So we're, we've gotten to the point where we've rolled out all of the old instances and the, the group size is being increased. So we're provisioning up to four instances at this point. And we should see, as we expect, that one is being created. Uh, the slides will be available. We'll be posting them, uh, if not today, probably tomorrow. Okay, so uh, we could, oh, okay, so one more question. Uh, what about the sample code? Uh, I think in the slides I show where that is. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so it's kind of hard to see, but down here at the bottom, uh, this is where all of the, the bootstrapping code lives. And uh, you should be able to replicate exactly what I did. Um, and uh, I, can, I can point to some examples for uh, basically the commands that I invoked to, to achieve the the setup. Uh, but basically at this point, rather than waiting for that final uh, instance to boot up, uh, we're going to close out. So, so once again, please, uh, please come check out our repo on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, feel free to file issues. Uh, please star it. We do pay attention to a number of stars. Uh, and yeah, give us some feedback. Thanks a lot for attending and I uh, hope to hear from you.